Okay, good morning. Big audience, it's too early. Uh, welcome to managing Postgres with Ansible. Um, just a quick question, how much Ansible do you know? Perfect. Perfect, because I have an intro for it. And now my clicker is not working. <laughs> okay, agenda for today. A little bit what is Postgres, what is Ansible, how you can use Ansible in ad hoc mode. Basically just running ad hoc commands on a server. Uh, how you can run Ansible playbooks. And then we combine everything what we learned in the previous talks and see that we can install and configure uh, Postgres installation. Okay. Okay. So, my name is Andreas Scherbaum. I live in Germany. I am one of the founding members of Postgres Europe. So, we run a couple of conferences, like last week, Friday, we had a Postgres conference Germany in Leipzig. So I'm actually in two conferences in one week. That's a new. Um, we also run Postgres Conference Europe later this year in October in Berlin, first in PG Day and a couple more. And I work for a company called Adjust in Berlin. We have about a thousand Postgres databases sitting around. And right now, also moving everything to Ansible from another tool called Rex. Uh, you will find these slides on my blog, so if you search for my name, you will most likely end up on my blog. And there's a link on the right side called Writings and Talks. This is not working. <laughs> and I will upload these slides there. Okay, you can also find me on Twitter or LinkedIn. And as I said, I have my own blog. We are also hiring, so if you're interested to work with rather large databases, so we occasionally run into problems in Postgres no one else has seen before. It's quite interesting. Okay. Do I need to tell you what Postgres is? Is this yes? <laughs> it's one of these relational databases. It comes with a BSD license, which basically means Take it, do whatever you want, don't change the license. You don't have to republish any source code. Couple projects you see here or on other conferences are just based on Postgres, forked it, developed a new product, good to go. Uh, it's known for very good SQL standard compliance. So it's one of the databases which is always mentioned as this is the most standard compliant database. And if it's not compliant, there are little differences in every database and it's very well documented. Uh, Postgres 15 will come out probably in October this year. So what is Ansible? It's a fictional device for faster than light communication. No, wait, that's another movie. <laughs> it's actually from a novel by Ursula Le Guin from 1966. And it was readapted in the movie uh, Ender's Game, where they had faster than light communication. But that's not what we're looking for. So we want to go with, it's an open source provisioning system for servers. Uh, you can use it to deploy servers, devices, basically everything in your network. Uh, one of the very nice features about Ansible, it is idempotent, which means you're defining a state your device is supposed to have, and Ansible tries to figure out how to get your device or your server to the state. As example, you say, I want to have a user on my system. You don't really care how Ansible does it. Ansible will create this user for you if it's not there. Uh, it's developed by mostly by Red Hat. Uh, it's written in Python. But you don't really have to know Python because the uh, DSL from Ansible abstracts all of it. Uh, you can use it to manage 
both Unix and Windows hosts and a couple other network devices like routers and firewalls and whatsoever. Uh, however, the host running your Ansible must be Linux or Unix. So you cannot run it on Windows. Uh, one of the nice things, if you write a playbook, it is basically documenting your infrastructure. So when you say, okay, I want to create a user, it's both the written context, the written state of your server, and the documentation of your server. Uh, as I said, it's idempotent. You can rerun an Ansible playbook as many times as you want. It will only change something if it's not the desired state of your playbook. We will see how that works. Uh, you can deploy this on many large systems in parallel, so Ansible runs in parallel. By default, it's 10 systems in parallel and then rotates over the servers you have. You can increase this if your Ansible host is powerful enough. Uh, but even if you run a couple hundred servers, Ansible will take care that it loops over all the servers and does all the jobs. You don't need to have a host agent on your server. However, you need to have SSH access. And you should configure it to be passwordless because you don't want to type in a couple hundred passwords every time you run the playbook. Uh, it requires Python 3 like almost every Python application these days, but the version is not really dependent. Okay, that's how it looks like. You have one Ansible controller. As mentioned, it must be Unix or Linux. Use SSH, SSH to connect to the servers, and then Ansible deploys temporarily some Python code on your remote server and executes it. And this is basically how it manages the servers. But once the playbook is done, all this code is removed, so it's agentless. And then it comes with hundreds of modules for basically everything you can find out there in infrastructure, like every kind of network devices. It supports all the big cloud systems, Google, Amazon, whatsoever. Uh, it has plenty of modules for all the different databases we have, so Postgres, MySQL, MongoDB, whatsoever. And of course, you can write your own module. What we're going to do today, we're looking at one host where we want to install Postgres and see how Ansible can do that for us. Uh, so if we look at the Postgres modules we have, so we have a module to create or manage databases. So we can say a database must exist or must not exist. So we can actually also use this to remove databases. Uh, we can create roles and memberships and schemas and tables, uh, privileges in a database. We can create replication slots. All of this has idempotent modules in Ansible. Uh, most interesting, we can also manage our PG HBA conf for accessing Postgres. So there's one mode in Ansible which is called ad hoc mode. It's something you can use in your daily life to do something on your servers. Uh, ad hoc is not really idempotent, however, you can use the Ansible modules on a command line. So let's say you have a couple dozen web servers and you want to create or touch or change one file on, on them. You can use the Ansible ad hoc mode to do this in parallel on all the different hosts. The very basic command we have is Ansible ping. This is not the same ping as we have on Unix command line. So Ansible ping will actually try to log into the server and see if Ansible can be run on the system. So if Ansible ping is working, you know well, the system is ready to be used by Ansible. That's how you use it. You specify Ansible on a command line as command on your host. You have to specify an inventory, basically where is it supposed to run. And then you pick the module, dash M, ping module, and then on which host. And in the simplest case, it's just on all hosts. And which means it runs on all hosts in our inventory. And be careful. This is a comma, because this is one of the things where you see Python coming through. This is a Python list. It's not just a single entry. It's always a list of hosts in your inventory.
And once you run it, you get some output here. It tells you, okay, I did this, I did this, I checked out what's on these servers, and you get a result back, uh, ping pong, so it was able to log in, it was able to run Ansible on your remote host, this is working. So we have success here. This is also important for us, so this module did not change anything on your remote host. It does SSH into the host, gathers all the effects, so it basically does everything, even if you run a playbook, and just stops right there. So you should be able to log in without password. Again, if you have hundreds of hosts, you don't want to type in password. Uh, you should use a regular user for login, and then use sudo, one of the sudo methods we have, uh, if you need to do anything as root or as a different user. And Zibel can manage all of this for you. Okay, let's see another example. Again, we have this inventory here. It's a Python list. Now we pick another module, which is called command. And command runs a Unix command on your remote host. Whatever Unix command you want to run. It runs in parallel on all hosts which you specify here. So in this case, it's only localhost. And then you have to specify a parameter. Uh, what command do you want to run? In this case, it's just uptime. So again, we get an output here. And something changed now. So why is it changed? Anyone got an idea? I mean, I just run an uptime command. Does the uptime command change anything on my remote host? No. But Ansible doesn't know that the shell command doesn't change anything. So by default, any time you run a shell command, it assumes, okay, something was changed. That's very important. And then we get the output of the command here. I mean, this host is up for five days. Uh, we have a little bit of load here because this is localhost. This is running a Ansible playbook right now. Good. Ansible will fetch both standard out and standard error from your remote host and will show you. It will also fetch the return code, at least on Unix. On Windows, we don't have a return code. And if the return code is not null, it will abort here. You can change this. Uh, so if you know one command on your remote side will actually be non-zero as a return code, you can tell Ansible, okay, this return code is actually okay. I expect this. This is fine. Uh, you can either do ignore errors, then Ansible will ignore any error in your play. Or you can say failed when, and then specify what is the condition when this failed. We will see later on in the playbooks that we use this one. Any other part, we can also tell Ansible when something is not changed on your host by using changed when. Again, we know this is an uptime command. We know it's not changing anything, so we can tell Ansible Okay, change when false, nothing changed on your host. Ansible actually has two different modules for running commands on your remote host. One is called command, and one is called shell. And the difference is, in the command module, it's very simple. There is no replacement of variables. There is no standard out, standard error redirect whatsoever. It's literally just the command. And if you want to have a remote shell on your host and run something in a shell, like a shell function whatsoever, then you can use the shell module. Like here, I have a pipe here, cat etc passvd, pipe to grab root, pipe to just get me one column out of it. Uh, this you can only do, this piping, in a shell module. If you try this in a command module, 
it will literally try to run this entire command as one command on your hosting buffet. Uh, in your daily life, you should really avoid using both shell and the command module because, well, first of all, they are not idempotent. So you don't really know what's changing on the remote side. And for most ta tasks you have, Ansible can just go and use one of the existing modules, which are idempotent. Good. Now we learned how we can use Ansible in ad hoc mode just to do something on the fly on the system. Now let's put all of this into playbooks. A playbook is basically just a collection of ad hoc tasks written down into a file so you can rerun these commands, this place, over and over again, idempotently. Uh, playbooks can be very large, so a couple thousand lines, it's, it's not uncommon. You can split them into roles, so you can say, okay, I want to install a web server, I want to install a database. This can be different roles, but it's not part of this talk. This is more aimed for in-depth Ansible talk. And you can specify where a playbook is supposed to run. So you can always specify, before we only said all, all hosts, and you can say, okay, I want to run a playbook on only database hosts, only web server hosts. And what we also need is an inventory. It can be, in my case, your hosts.config. Uh, in your inventory, you can specify, first of all, the hosts. You can group hosts into host groups. So you have 10 web servers, make it one web server group. And if you have a web server on a database group, group everything in your server group. And if you have this in three different data centers, group this into in a per data center group. What you also can do, you can specify variables on a per host basis, on a per group basis, whatsoever, and they override each other. Ansible has 17 or 18 different layers where you can specify variables. And they override, and you can say, okay, um, for my web server group, I have one setting. Uh, my web server is Nginx. And further down, you can say, okay, on one specific host, I don't want to have Nginx. I want to have Apache. That's how it looks like in, in reality. Uh, the config format can be either YAML or INI. I'm using INI here because it's better readable. So I have my all systems group here, which splits down into web server and databases. And then I have one variable settings, which is for the entire group, and it is exported down to all the different child groups. So this variable here is valid on all groups. And then I have a database group, one host in here. I specify one variable name, host name, which is just valid for this host. And then I have another variable which is valid for the entire group. All of this groups into playbooks. And one playbook, as I mentioned before, is a group of plays. So one play is one execution of one task in Ansible. Uh, you really want to make sure that your playbooks are idempotent, so you use the Ansible modules and not shell and command modules. And how that works with Postgres, we're going to check out now. So I have my one playbook here, and now this one is only running on all my host group databases. Remember, I defined the web server group, I defined the database group, I can also say all for all groups. This one only runs on my database group. So something changed here when I run this playbook. So again, I'm using Ansible Playbook now, no longer the Ansible ad hoc command. I still have to specify my inventory, but now my inventory is my file with all the hosts into it, so I don't have to specify my hundreds of hosts 
on a command line as one list. And here's my playbook now. And what changed here? I'm running an uptime task. What's missing? I could add the change when, yeah. But I'm running an uptime task here. What am I not seeing? The actually output of the uptime task. When I did the ad hoc command, it showed me what is the output of the command. When you run a playbook, uh, you potentially run it of on hundreds of t hosts. You're no longer interested in seeing all the different outputs here. If you want to see the output, yes, you can gather it and capture it and show it, but by default, the playbook will not show any of the standard out, standard error outputs here. It will just tell you, okay, I worked this task on this host, done. And yes, we have changed here, so if we add changed when, then it will actually not consider this one as changed. Yes, you could do that. Uh, the other thing we see now here is the is the summary. So this playbook did take one second to run. It did run on three hosts, and it changed uh, did run three tasks. Sorry. And out of the three tasks, it did change two. What is the third task? The third task is this gathering facts. So by default, every time you run the playbook, the very first thing Ansible is doing is log into the server and gather a bunch of facts about this host. Host names, IP addresses, uh, operating system, memory available, CPU, whatsoever. It's a big gather fact step, getting all of this data which you can later use as inventory facts. And this one is implicit, so you can turn it off, but by default it's turned on. And then we have our two tasks here, so these both changed something on the host, but we no longer see what was changed. Uh, what happens if you have 20 hosts and it gathering facts cannot connect to one? By default, this one host will stop and all the other hosts will continue. You can also change it in a way that Ansible will stop the entire playbook at this point. But by default, only the hosts which are not reachable or failed will stop right there and the others keep going. So, summary again. Regular Ansible command is all about ad hoc commands. You want to change something on a fly, you want to look up something. Very often I just go and check out what kind of Postgres version do we have on servers installed or um, what's the disk space usage on certain systems. I just go and you see ad hoc command uh, using df and just gather me some output from all database servers. That's something I can do on a fly, I don't have to log in. And then again, we have playbooks which do all the interesting stuff like install something, configure something, change something, uninstall something. This is hard written into the playbooks. This answers your question here. If you have a setting, any errors fatal, this will abort the entire playbook if one of the hosts encounters one error. This can be some, com some players failing, this can be some of the host is not reachable. Any error will abort the entire playbook. Uh, this might be useful for certain use cases. For most use cases it's not because playbooks are supposed to be idempotent so you can just rewind them. If you see one host is not reachable, you go and check out, you ask the infrastructure team, why is this host not up? And they power it up again and then you rewind the playbook. Uh, the playbook already fixed all the other hosts, and when you rerun it, it will just work on this one host. So I'm trying this here. I'm using one command which doesn't exist, so it will throw an error on the shell. 
and you see it did run my playbook. It failed here. So I get an error message back. And then I have one failed host here. Good. Any questions so far about playbooks, plays, Ansible? Let's set up a database. Uh, there's nothing to roll back. Uh, the ways, the question was if something changes, uh, if something fails, will it roll back the change? No. Uh, well, that said, there is an option in Ansible that you can do a rollback, but you have to write what you want to roll back. Uh, by default, because every step is idempotent, you don't really care if something fails. You just rerun it once you fix the problem. You define a state on your server. I, I want to have a user. Then Ansible goes and tries to create a user. If it fails, you figure out why, and we want it, and we go and create a user. Well, every play is atomic, but only the one Ansible task is atomic. Okay, what we're going to do now, we're going to install a Postgres database. Uh, we check if we can actually connect to the database. We create a new role, we create a new database. Uh, we make sure that we can connect to the database. We create a table, we create an index, and we run a query in our database, all using Ansible modules. Good. How do I install packages? Well, I have an operating system tool. On the Red Hat, it's RPM. On Debian, it's apt or apt-get. This would be the step if I want to install Postgres, in this case, Postgres 13, on Debian or Ubuntu. apt-get install or apt install Postgres 13. So it gives me a bunch of output here. So I want to install these packages. I install the packages and so on. Um, not really very interesting. This would be the same command if I try this using Ansible at hoc mode. So I'm using the apt module in Ansible. And as a parameter, I specify which packages I want to have installed. And I can also specify a state. So most modules in Ansible have a default state. Like if you want to install a package, the default state is present. It's to be installed. But you can also say absent if you want to uninstall a package. Or you, want to, you can say it's purge, that it will also remove the configuration files for a package. Okay, again, I want to run this on all servers here. That's my inventory. Um, so there's one Im important part here. This dash B will run this as user root. So everything by default so far was run as a user we use as login using SSH. And now we say dash B, it tries to do a sudo and run this module as root. So what happens if I do this? Again, I get my entire output here because it's ad hoc mode, so it tells me, okay, we have some facts here. Uh, something was changed. And Ansible did install my packages. There's no error messages. Error messages, so everything went fine. How do I run this as a playbook? Again, I have to specify become yes. I can either do this on a playbook level, so this entire playbook runs as root, or I can also say become yes on a task level, if only one task is to be run as root. Then I have my app module. I have to specify which packages I want to install. So I'm installing one more here, the Python 3 packages, because I need them later on. And then I have my default state present. So let's say what happens. It installs my 
package, but it only tells me, okay, one host has changed. I don't see any more information anymore. What happens if I rerun the playbook a second time? Nothing. Because it's idempotent, the package is already installed, and we see changed zero. So we can rerun this playbook as many times as we want. That's useful if you have some CI pipeline. You can just plug in your playbook in the CI pipeline and just deploy everything, Jenkins or Ansible Tower. Okay, as mentioned before, we have this state parameter. We usually it's present, which will install a package. Um, if a package is already installed, the app module will not upgrade it if there's a newer one. Present just means one version is available. If you say latest and there's a newer version available, it will try to upgrade it. And of course, every dependent package as well. And if you say absent, it will uninstall it. Good, we have a database installed. Let's see if it's actually working. Like the Ansible ping module, the Postgres package also has a Postgres ping module. What does it do? It logs into the host and it tries to connect to the database, making sure that the credentials we have can log in. Uh, if you have any kind of database playbook, this is kind of useful to have as a very first step, just to make sure you have connectivity. Everything is there as expected if you want to run a playbook. Because otherwise, if you can't connect to the database and you try to do something later on, you get some fancy error messages and you don't know where this is coming from. Uh, this module will run on your remote host, on your database host. So it's not running on your Ansible controller, it's running on your database host. So we use the PostgreSQL ping module. We have to specify a database because in Postgres we are always logging in into a database. Uh, we want to use Unix domain socket for login and we use the login user Postgres. And then we already know the become yes option. However, we are not going to use root here. We are telling Ansible try this as a Postgres user on Unix. Okay, we run this module. It tells us, okay, nothing changed because we only try to log into the database. That's fine. We have a connectivity, we can move on. Now, we want to have a new role or new user and we want to have a new database in Postgres. We have two modules for it. One is called Postgres SQL User and one is called Postgres SQL DB. Uh, we have very same settings here again, so we need to specify a login database, a login user, and then we specify what is the new user we want to create in our database, and what is the password for it. Again, we are running this as Postgres user. Um, one thing you need to make sure, this password here is in clear text. So wherever has access to your playbook, can see this password. So you most likely want to have it in an Ansible fault and just use a variable name here. But how to do this is beyond this uh, talk. Okay, we can also use the user module to drop users. In this case, again, it's a PostgreSQL user module. We specify which username or which role name and we say absent. And the module will try to drop this user, which only works if this user has no objects in the database. Like if this user still owns a table or a schema or a database, it cannot be dropped. In the same way we created users, we can also create databases. We have the PostgreSQL DB module. Again, we specify what is the name so we are using this <coughs> sorry we're using this variable syntax here in Ansible, which we use the variable name demo db 
and whatever is in your variable name demodb will be used as name here. And you can also specify a user who owns this database. If you don't do it, then the database will be owned by Postgres by default. Uh, we have a couple more options for the DB module because it cannot only create and drop databases, it can also do backups, which comes quite useful, handy. So if you specify a state of dump, then it will create a backup of your database into a file. Obviously, this is not idempotent. Every time you run a backup, it creates a new backup. And if you say state restore, it will try to restore the backup into the database. Uh, you need to specify a file name where the backup goes to. Good, now we have a database running, we have a username. Let's get some access. Uh, how many of you know how you do access in PostgreSQL? There's one file called pghbaconf, which is host-based authentication. And it basically has one line or a couple lines and every line is passed and checked for access. So all we have to do in theory is add new one line. However, the order of the line is important because Postgres scans the file from top to bottom and the first matching line is picked and no other line is used. Um, there's the HBA module for Postgres and Ansible. However, it can only add new lines or make sure that a specific line is already in this file. It's a bit of a problem because a new line will only be added at the end, which might not be what we want. Um, there's one more option I'm using here, which is called notify. This comes very handy. Uh, Ansible has a concept of triggers. Every time a module changes something, it will call this trigger down here. The trigger name is just free text. And you, of course, have to define this trigger somewhere else. And it basically says, what is Ansible going to do if this module changed something? In this case, I name it Reload Postgres, and somewhere else in my trigger handles, I defined what exactly is to do if I want to reload Postgres. And when the playbook ends, Ansible figures out, okay, which of the many triggers in my file got called, and will fire all of them and execute all of them. Why is this handy? Uh, every time I change this file in Postgres, pghbaconf, I need to reload the database to make sure Postgres knows about the new file. Uh, without trigger, I would have to store the state of this play in a variable and had to figure out at the end of my playbook, did something change and yes, then I have to do this task. Using this notify on the trigger just outsources all of this work to Ansible. I don't have to care. Ansible figures out, okay, this play changed something, um, let's go and fire the trigger later on. Um, as mentioned before, the PGHBA uh, file is really line-based. Uh, there are two other modules in Ansible, they're called line in file and block in file, uh, which can change a config of a file based on lines or blocks. They are probably more useful in this case than using the PGHBA module. Or, like we are doing, there's also a template module uh, which basically recreates an entire template, a file from a template. And the way we are deploying pghbaconf is we have some standard templates for pghbaconf, and then in the template module you can do all kinds of Ansible, fancy, Python, uh, Jinja 2 things, uh, loop over variables, and basically recreate an entire template. Uh, that's what we are doing, so we have the config for the pghba conf in our environment, and then every time we deploy the database, we crea recreate the entire file from scratch. Comes more handy than the Postgres module here. 
uh, in Debian, not in Red Hat, this file actually lives in etc PostgreSQL, so you need to have root access to change it. In uh, Red Hat systems, it lives in a data directory. So you don't need to have root access. And then, as I mentioned before, you have this trigger here. Um, somewhere else in the handler section, you need to define what this trigger is supposed to do. So I have my trigger name here. And then I can just specify service is another Ansible module, which can work on Unix system services. And I say, okay, I want to have the PostgreSQL service reloaded. And Ansible just does it for me. Which logic? The service? I, I have to write this part in my playbook, yes. Well, the PGCT, PGCTL reload is actually service reload here. Service is an Ansible module, which knows about all the different services we have. And since we use the Debian package, it already comes with a service module. If you, of course, install Postgres from source somewhere, the operating system doesn't know, then you have to change this to something like command and do your own PG CTL reload. Uh, this service actually works on every Unix system. So it knows about system D, it knows about OpenRC and so on. Uh, as long as you use a system package, it will know how to do this. Yeah. Which makes it very handy because you don't know the details. Okay, you can call handlers multiple times. They will not be executed right away. So if you have like five different places which say reload PostgreSQL, they will only be one at the end of the playbook once. It's not that something happens like I changed my PGA conf now and now it's reloading Postgres and then I'm changing some config setting and then it's restarting Postgres and then in the middle something fails and I have a dead service. Or you can actually have Ansible do all of this at the end once you're done with your playbook. Uh, one important thing, the way how you define the handlers in your handler file is important. They are executed from top to bottom. So whichever handler is uh, specified first, is executed first. Good, now I have my updated pghba conf file. I have my new demodb demo user file. Let's see if I can actually make use of it. So I want to create a table and an index. We have modules for it. So PostgreSQL table module. I can specify what is my table name. I can specify in which schema this lives. I can specify all the, all the columns with all the details. Like, okay, I want to have a text column or I want to have a sale column and so on. Um, basically, everything you can do in Postgres to define a table, you can outsource to the PostgreSQL, PostgreSQL table command. However, it is not fully idempotent. Uh, if you create a table, it will create a table for you. If you later on change the table definition in your playbook, this module will not change your table. So, that's a bit of a pity. Maybe someone fixes this at some point. Um, your initial table set is just fine. It will create it as it is, as you specify it. But later on, any changes you do in a playbook, they are just ignored. You can also use it to create, uh, to drop tables, of course, or to truncate tables, to rename a table. Uh, you can also create unlock tables, so you don't write any wall information for tables, which is use useful for temporary tables. And in the same way we created a table, we can create an index. 
So you specify the index name on which table, on which column or columns in Postgres. And you can also specify the index method. So by default, it's between, but you can have a just index on a specific column. Um, unlike in Postgres itself, in Ansible, you always have to specify an index name. So in Postgres, if you say create index, Postgres will temporarily or manually create an index name for you. Uh, here you have to specify an index name. Otherwise, multiple columns is possible, other index type is possible, you can even create it in another table space. Good, now I have my table, I have my index on it, everything worked as expected. Good, we have a database, we have a table, we have an index, we have a user. What's left? We need to run a query. We can also do this in Ansible. We have the PostgreSQL query module. Um, the same way you used all the other modules, we have to specify the database name here. Uh, and then you specify which query you want to run. So in this case here, it's a static query, but most likely you're composing your query in your playbook out of some variables. Like you want to insert the table name and the column names from some variables. Up to you. Um, like the command modules and shell module in Ansible, the PostgreSQL module, the query module, will always change the database. So even though this was a select command, Ansible doesn't really know that it's a select command is not changing anything in the database. So by default, every query you run with the PostgreSQL query module is marked as changed. Again, we, you can use changed when and turn this off. Um, also, the queries are not idempotent because Ansible is not really managing the content of the database. If you rerun a query and someone else changed the database, you get different results back. Not idempotent. Um, you cannot only use a single query here, you can also use a text file and just run the entire content of the text file in your database. You can use placeholders like prepared queries in your database. All of this works. It's a bit advanced. Um, if you want to know what works, come and ask me. Yeah. Yep. Okay. We are running a query in a database. If it's a select query, we most likely want to know what we selected, so we want to access the result. Uh, one of the nice features in Ansible is you can, at every play, do register and store the result of the play in a variable name. In this case here, I say it's select result. And then later on, you can use the debug module to access the content of your variable. If you just say, okay, I want to see the entire select result variable, it shows you everything which is into it. And this is something you can do with every single play. You can just say, I have a register, whatever variable name you use, and then one step later or several steps later, you can say, debug, show me what is the result of my play using debug. Makes it quite handy for debugging, not only for the PostgreSQL query module, basically for every Ansible module. Good, I have eight entries in my table name here, or in my table here. Good, so far we used playbooks. Um, we automated most of it. However, we are still running playbooks from our laptop or workstation. There's one step further you can go in Ansible. And this is called Ansible Tower. And Ansible Tower can outsource the running of the playbooks for you. 
So you can configure which playbook to run on which host. You can provide credentials in Tower. Uh, the nice thing about it is um, only Ansible Tower needs to have access to all the credentials and the hosts. Because if you run a playbook from your personal laptop, you need to have access to all the credentials and all the hosts. If this is for every developer in your company, everyone needs to have access to everything. Most likely not something you want to do. Using Tower, you can outsource it. It has a nice web interface. You can even go as far and say, okay, I define a specific task. This is to run, and someone else can just trigger the task. And by triggering, this can be someone from a sales department wants to deploy something. Click on this and it deploys. Or it can be GitHub, GitLab. I push something to my repository. This triggers a deploy to my servers. Makes it very convenient. Uh, Ansible Tower is a commercial product by Red Hat. However, there's an open source version which is called AWX. Same functionality, no branding. Good. What did we learn? We can use Ansible to manage a large fleet of servers. We have modules for basically everything we want to deploy, change, configure, uninstall. Uh, playbooks are hopefully idempotent, so you can just rerun this every time, over and over again. And playbooks are self-documenting. So basically you write your infrastructure as code and along the way document it. Couldn't be any better. We have about 120 different Ansible modules, and we have a handful of very useful Postgres modules, which we can use the, to manage the entire Postgres database here. Any questions? Is there a module which works with cloud providers like ADS? Uh, I mean, you have modules for AWS anyway. I don't know if ADS specifically has modules. It's it's most likely a use case. <laughs> I mean, if you run it on, N on, on AWS, you probably have some other means of deployment anyway. I have some white and black stickers, Postgres stickers here if you want. Come and grab some. Any other question? I did not cover it. Um, basically, with Terraform, you just state how your one specific server or system should look like. And with Ansible, you can well, go beyond that. You can uh, you, you specify how every single service should look like. You can do changes on the fly. You can uninstall packages. Terraform is basically just your initial deployment of a system. How do you change a uh, system which is once deployed with Terraform? You cannot nest them, but you want to look into roles. Roles. Uh, yes, because you can specify the HBA conf. Okay, thank you.